I see. Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we have a visitor from neurology who's going to speak to you about this uh, theme. But before that, a, a few comments about history so that we remember the people who got us to where we are. In 1697, 1697, quite a few years ago, Isaac Newton received and solved a problem provided by Jean Bernoulli. And Jean Bernoulli was a Swiss mathematician who put out a, math a mathematic problem and Isaac, I guess, got it, sat down over breakfast and finished it. And at age 55, he decided, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to publish this, but I want the publisher to put it, publish it anonymously. And this is where the famous term comes. But, but the brilliant originality of the work betrayed his identity. For when Berluni saw the solution, he commented, we recognize the lion by his claw. In do solving that problem, Newton also developed a new branch of mathematics called calculus of variations. About 200 years after that, 1896, was the death on this day of Alexander Macmillan. And Alexander Macmillan was a Scottish publisher. He was not a physician. He was not a scientist. But he published Nature. And the first edition of Nature was in November 4th of 1869. I want to read you the mission of that journal, which is true today, to place before the general public the grand results of scientific work and scientific discovery, and to urge the claims of science to move to a more general recognition in education and in daily life. And that mission still remains today with that journal. We also remember eight, in 1848, on this day, Henry David Thoreau delivered a first draft of a document that as soon as I mention, many of you will know. But I we, was reminded about this because I saw so many people marching in Washington on Saturday, and he wrote his best-known work called Civil Disobedience. And he wrote this after being in jail because he decided not to pay a, toll, a poll tax that was meant to support America's war in Mexico. Nobody cared about his work, but later on it got quite a bit of prominence because he really worked on the concept of passive resistance and it's thought that his writings really influenced Gandhi and Martin Luther King. But today is about neurology, okay? And, and I think the, the initial title has something about hallucinations and things like that. So I, I want to remind you about three people very quickly. Thomas Willis was born this week back in 1621. He was a English physician. He did a lot of contributions about the anatomy of the brain. He injected wax, liquid wax, in the brain and was able to see the circle that was later called the Circle of Willis. We also remember that on this week was the birth in 1903 of John Eccles. And I'm not sure how to pronounce this. E-C-C-L-E-S. Eccles or Eccles. Uh, and John Carew Eccles was an Australian physiologist who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, for medicine or physiology in 1963, he discovered the chemical means by which impulses are communicated or repressed by nerve cells. And basically, he injected little tiny electrodes and could watch these impulses moving from one cell to another. And finally, we remember Eward Herring, H-E-R-I-N-G, who died on this day in 1918 at the age of 83. Carl Eward Constantine Herring was a German physiologist and psychologists who worked a lot on the physiology of color perception. And he did quite a bit of work on optical illusion. And with that, I want to introduce you our speaker of the day, Catherine LaFaver. And we thank you for being here. She is an assistant professor and director of the Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Clinic at the University of Louisville. She obtained her medical degree at Albert Lewitz University at Freiburg, Germany. From that, she moved on to the States. And she did internal medicine for one year, as you usually do to move on to neurology, uh, which she did also did at Mayo Clinic. And she did a clinical fellowship and movement disorders at Beth Israel in Boston. And from there, she went to the NIH, to the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where she worked under the mentorship of Mark Halet in movement disorders. And the university was lucky enough that in 2013, she was recruited to University of Louisville, and she's currently the Raymond Lee Levy Endowed Professorship in Parkinson's Disease Research, which she's going to talk to you about today. She's engaged in a number of clinical trials and other work, and she's uh, written about Parkinson's disease and other uh, movement disorders. She's very passionate about this um, area, and today she's going to talk to us about this so that we all internists from now on 
know to treat the condition or refer to her, one of the two. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for this kind introduction and uh, welcome. I'm glad to be here. It's the second time I'm actually here for Grand Round, so I'm uh, happy to be invited back. Uh, so uh, as you already announced, the topic for today's uh, uh, Grand Rounds is hallucinations and psychosis and Parkinson's disease. Um, and I hope that uh, this is going to be a little bit broader and uh, um, a lot of what we're going to be talking is probably also applicable to psychosis in other settings such in Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, so I don't have any disclosures for this talk. So uh, kind of following the historic uh, kind of overview, so of course hallucinations and psychosis is something that has fascinated people uh, for ages, right? I mean, I'm not going as far back to the Bible here to start out, but uh, obviously it's, it's kind of a very popular theme uh, in uh, literature, in uh, cinematography. And a very fascinating book by uh, the well-known Oliver Sacks uh, dealing with hallucinations, uh, so I highly recommend that. Uh, so kind of to start out, we'll just uh, uh, hear some patient quotes. And these are all my patients uh, seen within the past couple months, uh, just to get a bit of a flavor of what uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about. So one of my patients, an older, elderly female, uh, told me, when I go to bed at night, I feel as if there already is a person laying in my bed. So obviously something very frightening, right? Um, and uh, another uh, of my patients told me, when I open my drawers, getting dressed in the morning, etc., it seems like there's spiders crawling out. I and mean, then the spiders crawl up to the walls and ceiling, and it's just kind of very disturbing. Um, another of my patients told me, um, my brother often comes and sits in the room with me. Uh, now, that doesn't sound too unusual, and, unless you actually know that her brother has deceased many years ago. Um, and uh, finally, another patient reported a little bit of a different flavor, so she didn't see uh, necessarily uh, things in the room, but uh, she kind of was pretty convinced that her children were stealing money from her. Um, and of course, you know, that can happen, but uh, her children seem to be pretty devoted uh, caregivers to her, and uh, she just, uh, over time, over uh, the years with her disease, got, got pretty paranoid and, and suspicious, and was, uh, that's, uh, as probably many of you have experienced with patients also, can be something very uh, difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, so we'll be kind of reviewing uh, a bit broader non-motor manifestations in Parkinson's disease and then talking more specifically about hallucination psychosis, uh, uh, specifically in Parkinson's. And uh, again, much of this uh, is applying broader to uh, similar conditions. Uh, and then as far as we know, we'll, we'll dive a little bit into pathophysiology and then finally treatment options. So Parkinson's disease, um, as you, uh, well, most people kind of associate tremor with Parkinson's, which is certainly uh, true. Um, however, uh, re tremor, or more specific resting tremor, is only uh, present in about 70% of Parkinson's patients. So it's important to realize that tremor is not an obligatory feature of Parkinson's disease. Uh, that being said, the core features of Parkinson's disease are certainly the resting tremor, rigidity, bradykinesias and gait changes and postural instability. Now, in the past 10 years or so, it's been increasingly clear that Parkinson's is much more than a motor disease. And these so-called non-motor features uh, are very uh, important to realize because they can be actually more disabling to the patient, partly because the treatment options are often limited. Uh, so what are these non-motor features? So this ranges from what we'll be talking uh, about uh, the rest of the um, uh, time today, the psychiatric features, and the most uh, common ones are actually anxiety, depression. Now, it's also important that these non-motor features are often present many years before the motor features of Parkinson's emerge. So patients can often have a history of depression, anxiety for 10, 20 years before Parkinson's emerges. Uh, cognitive issues, so memory uh, problems, uh, issues with uh, spatial orientation are very common in, in Parkinson's disease. So that's why even early in the disease, it's important to ask, you know, uh, with driving, uh, have people had more issues uh, getting in accidents? 
uh, because depth perception is also involved. So that's one of the reasons why judging distances uh, can become a, a problem. Uh, sensory issues, very common. So a lot of people experience pain. And as internists, uh, it might be important to know that shoulder pain spe specifically can be a very early manifestation of Parkinson's. So it's not uncommon for people to go to a primary doctor or orthopedist, complain of shoulder pain, uh, get a rotator cuff surgery, and then maybe half a year later, a year later, it's recognized, um, well, it's kind of more to it. The arm also doesn't swing. There might be a tremor emerging, and it turns out to be Parkinson's disease. Uh, so pain can be an early feature, and we're not exactly sure why, but one thought is the arm, for example, doesn't swing as much, so the joint doesn't get lubricated, and that can cause pain. Uh, and certainly just the, the lack of dopamine, uh, people later in stages of the disease, when the dopamine uh, bears off and when medication bears off, that often is a painful state. Um, autonomic features, again, can be present uh, prior to the motor manifestations. Uh, specifically, constipation is very common, uh, loss of smell, um, urinary issues, bladder uh, urgency, frequency, very common issues. Uh, and that's also when we uh, try to co-manage patients, right? So we don't try to treat all of these uh, symptoms and uh, refer to you to kind of get help with, uh, with some of these symptoms. Um, also, orthostatic hypotension, very common problem. And then finally, sleep issues. Uh, so insomnia is uh, very common. 70, 80% of Parkinson's patients complain of insomnia, either troubles falling asleep, troubles staying asleep, and then kind of a... Uh, very typical thing to experience is the so-called REM sleep behavior disorders. So people having more vivid dreams, acting out their dreams, moving, crashing around, and that can be a quite dangerous condition because people can fall out of bed, uh, punch their partner, so it can be dangerous for uh, the patient and the bed partner alike. Uh, so as I said, the, these non-motor symptoms are often the most uh, disabling. Uh, there was one study, I guess I didn't quote it here, but one study by University of Maryland, uh, which again uh, found that patients are actually the most disabled from non-motor symptoms, and specifically, I guess I didn't mention fatigue, uh, gait uh, problems, um, and then the uh, dys dysarthria. So it's not really always the, the tremor that's kind of the most visible symptom that really causes uh, the disability. Now, uh, how about these neuropsychiatric symptoms? Uh, well, as you all know, it is uh, very uh, difficult uh, for not only patients, but also for caregivers to deal with hallucinations and psychosis. And uh, specifically for the caregiver, these uh, symptoms are among the greatest source of uh, caregiver stress and poor quality of life. Um, and uh, hallucinations of in patients with Parkinson's are also the main determinant of nursing home uh, placement, um, as well as being associated with higher mortality. So here's a study um, out of Norway by uh, Doug Arsland et al. And from 2000. And they uh, followed prospectively a large number of Parkinson's patients and found that the uh, four-year cumulative risk for nursing home admission is uh, almost fourfold in uh, patients with hallucinations versus uh, uh, patients without hallucinations. Uh, so a pretty uh, significant uh, risk factor. Uh, so before we kind of uh, uh, dive into uh, this topic more, I want to uh, uh, give you some definitions. So what are we exactly talking about? Uh, so psychosis means uh, hallucinations, illusions, and uh, delusions occurring in the presence of intact sensorium. Um, and uh, um, important uh, to distinguish this from delirium, which uh, can be uh, um, not a permanent state. So hallucinations are defined as a sensory phenomenon not induced by physical stimuli and can affect all modalities. Uh, and you may have uh, learned or heard this that uh, as opposed to schizophrenia, their hallucinations are most commonly auditory uh, in uh, organic brain disorders such as Parkinson's, the most common uh, hallucinations are visual, and kind of that was uh, a bit evident in these case examples I gave in, in the beginning. So very typical hallucinations would be seeing small animals, uh, such as insects, um, mice, 
critters, anything like that is pretty common, um, or people. And oftentimes it's small people, uh, so it's sort of like this, uh, uh, it's also termed the Alice in Wonderland <laughs> syndrome, so it's small children. Uh, it's usually not or often not uh, um, people that are known to the person, but they just kind of uh, feel that there are uh, people in the room. It's not always formed hallucinations. So sometimes, especially even in early stages, people might just kind of feel there's a shadow or kind of more like in the uh, peripheral vision, feel there's uh, some shapes and might be someone walking or moving by and when they turn the head, they don't see it. So it's usually an early uh, kind of precursor. Um, illusions means the altered perception of an actual physical stimuli. Uh, so there might be, especially that can often occur at night, sort of in dim light, uh, there might just be a, a, um, a coat uh, hanging in the room and people perceive it um, as a person. And then finally, delusions are kind of fixed false beliefs despite evidence of the contrary. So that would have been the example uh, that the, the person uh, convinced that her children are stealing from her, um, et cetera. Now, it's also important that as opposed to schizophrenia, where people are usually pretty convinced that what they're experiencing is real, that um, with Parkinson's disease, patients often have retained insight into uh, the hallucinations. So uh, again, a couple uh, examples for common hallucinations. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, distinguish between present hallucinations so the feeling of a person uh, is uh, close to someone or behind uh, oneself. Uh, passage hallucination. So these would be kind of these fleeting shadows in the peripheral vision and formed visual hallucinations. And again, these are often animals or people. Um, and then although auditory hallucinations are less common, uh, they definitely can occur as well. Uh, for example, people can report hearing music or mumbling voices. Um, other uh, senses, such as tactile hallucinations, are much less common. And uh, uh, as far as the delusions, uh, as I already mentioned, the uh, kind of suspicion, uh, uh, then jealousy is a, a pretty common uh, issue. Uh, so beliefs of infidelity of a partner. Um, the capgrass delusion is, is uh, interesting, um, and uh, that is a belief that a family member or someone else has been replaced by an imposter. So people might report, well, you know, she looks like my spouse, but she, she's not my spouse. So she just kind of looks like Linda, but uh, she's, she's just pretending to be her. So this is usually in uh, reference to a person, although it's also been reported in the literature uh, to be actually in, in uh, uh, reference to objects. There's this uh, patient who uh, thought that uh, the plants in her garden were fake or pretending to be the plants in her garden. So it's quite, quite interesting. Um. So how common is this? Well, it's much more common than we realize. And I think part of the problem is we probably don't ask enough about it, especially in, in people in fairly early stages. We, you know, it's, it's um, might, again, if, it, if you don't ask for it, people might not report it uh, because people are ashamed of experiencing this. People might uh, fear they get labeled as crazy if they uh, talk about this. Uh, so it's really important uh, to, to specifically ask for this. And not only the patient, but ideally the spouse, caregiver, uh, because uh, um, that uh, can be much more reliable. So the lifetime prevalence for visual hallucinations is estimated at 50%, and in later stages is probably much higher. Uh, so there were several recent studies, and uh, the prevalence, again, uh, because it's, it's difficult to really get reliable measures, uh, so the estimates uh, in non-demented PD patients was found anywhere to be, uh, be between 22 and 60 percent. And again, uh, there were differences in the study populations and the criteria used, so it's difficult to get a um, correct um, estimate, but... Uh, uh, it's higher than we think. Uh, and again, it's especially important to realize that these were non-demented patients. So the current used working group criteria for PD psychosis are kind of listed here, and this is from NID, NIDS. Uh, so uh, PD psychosis is defined as hallucinations, delusion, and illusions occurring continuously or recurrently 
for at least one month. So again, this would be the main distinguishing feature from delirium, which we obviously see much more commonly, especially here in the hospital. Um, it's also important uh, to make sure that these symptoms are not um, occurring um, to um, uh, medication uh, or other kind of uh, infection and things like that. Again, they're all reversible. And uh, finally, symptoms should not be accounted for by a primary uh, psychiatric, psychiatric disorder or uh, uh, dementia of a fluid body. So some of the risk factors, uh, certainly increasing age uh, is a risk factor. Uh, duration and severity of Parkinson's disease, so certainly this is more common as a, a disease gets more advanced. Uh, cognitive impairment, dementia, as well as depression are risk factors. Uh, sleep disturbances, and then certainly medications, and especially with anticholinergic and uh, dopaminergic mechanisms. Um, so what do we know what is really causing uh, PD psychosis? Well, any time uh, there's more than three theories, uh, it kind of more or less means we don't know. <laughs> uh, despite that, I'm going to walk you through some, some hypotheses. So uh, people think there might be dysfunction of the limbic uh, structures, and uh, uh, that certainly occurs in uh, especially more advanced uh, stages of Parkinson's disease. Um, so one of the hypotheses is that uh, receptors get desensitized by the medications we use to treat Parkinson's disease, which act on the dopamine receptors, and uh, um, that can, can lead uh, to hallucinations. Uh, visual processing deficits, uh, so I mentioned uh, um, earlier that uh, depth perception is affected in Parkinson's disease, but other um, issues are the, the visual processing are affected as well. So visual um, acuity is often decreased and color vision, uh, and then oftentimes because these are elderly patients, uh, we have presence of other eye disorders, uh, macular degeneration, etc. Um, and that uh, has a high, is associated with higher prevalence of hallucinations as well. Uh, sleep disorders. So I mentioned that uh, REM sleep behavior disorders are very common in Parkinson's, and there's an interesting theory that people might be experiencing REM sleep intrusion during the wakeful state, which could be a correlate of uh, hallucinations. Uh, so it's not uh, completely uh, proven, but again, this is a hypothesis um, coming from the sleep literature. Um, and uh, kind of coming back to the uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, so just uh, um, this being uh, in a dopamine depleted state and then being often in dopaminergic, serotonergic, and uh, acetylcholinergic medications, kind of coming back to the medication-induced uh, uh, cause for hallucinations. And finally, structural abnormalities, so the position of Lewy bodies uh, in uh, both the areas dealing with uh, visual perception and uh, emotions uh, is uh, probably certainly the, the most uh, uh, convincing cause uh, underlying uh, the hallucinations. So what are these uh, Lewy bodies? Uh, the Lewy bodies are really the hallmark of Parkinson's disease. Um, and as far as we understand, um, these are uh, bodies that consist mostly of abnormally folded alpha-synuclein. Uh, so alpha synuclein gets misfolded for a number of reasons, and if we would completely understand it, we would be hopefully able to cure Parkinson's, and uh, we certainly are uh, closer now than we were 10 years ago. Uh, so there are a lot of different reasons. Well, for example, one of the genetic causes of getting Parkinson's disease is a, a triplication of the alpha synuclein gene. So just uh, um, too much alpha synuclein can cause uh, misformation. Uh, and then probably environmental influences, uh, such as pesticide exposure, uh, can, can trigger this as well. Um, the alpha, these Lewy bodies accumulate in the substantia nigra and other parts in the brain and are, uh, again, thought to be responsible for the uh, cellular death and uh, neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease. Uh, what we have come to understand is that these Lewy bodies seem to be prion-like uh, particles and seem to be able to spread from cell to cell. And that's really a concept that's been more commonly accepted 
not only for prion diseases, but for many neurodegenerative diseases, uh, such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Huntington's disease. Uh, so the, again, uh, the know now that these um, abnormal, abnormal Lewy bodies are not only in the substantia nigra, that's kind of what we all learn in medical school, right? Substantia nigra, Parkinson's, uh, that's kind of what, what where the dopamine is produced. Uh, but we know that in very early stages of Parkinson's, we actually find these Lewy bodies in the gut, uh, but more in the colon, as well as in the olfactory system. And uh, um, there seems to be a spread uh, throughout the nervous system that starts in the periphery. So again, usually in the olfactory uh, region, olfactory bulbs and the gut, and then uh, seems to travel up via the vagus nerve to the brainstem. Um, and then oftentimes, so that's kind of why we think that people often have constipation and the loss of smell very early on, right, 10, 20 years before getting Parkinson's disease. When these Lewy bodies uh, involve the brainstem, that is kind of thought to cause the REM sleep behavior disorder. And again, that is often present a couple years before people get their motor symptoms. Uh, the Lewy bodies then go to the midbrain and uh, cause the motor symptoms, so the tremor, bradykinesias. And then finally, in later stages, spread throughout the cortex and the limbic system, and that is when we would expect the emotional dysregulation, the memory issues, and, and just kind of more progressive disease in general. Uh, so this goes, this whole concept goes back to Heiko Brock, which is a, a who's a, a actually it's a, a German uh, neuropathology uh, uh, couple, and they have published on this quite extensively, and it's, it's now a pretty um, um, uh, accepted um, concept, uh, there have been animal studies uh, infesting mice with uh, these Lewy bodies, and it's been proven that these really uh, do get taken up and uh, uh, go through the nervous system. And interestingly, if they feed animals Lewy bodies and actually cut the vagal nerve, they did not develop uh, the Lewy body spread. So maybe, just maybe, <laughs> in the future, um, we would be have uh, uh, ways to detect these very early forms of Lewy bodies and uh, uh, maybe uh, va uh, vagal nerve <laughs> interventions could be, could be helpful in actually preventing the spread of this. So this is still future talk, but uh, um, again, it's very intriguing to find out more about new ways of uh, how the Lewy body spread could really happen and, and cause these, uh, these neurodegenerative diseases. Now, the big mystery, of course, is, well, if that's really true, and if that's true for Huntington's, for Parkinson's, for, for Alzheimer's, why do some of these disorders happen very rapidly, such as uh, CGD, which is obviously the kind of a pre, uh, main poster child for a prion disorder and uh, uh, people die within the year, uh, versus disorders such as Parkinson's, which are usually progressive over 15, 20 years, and we don't know. So after this little excursion uh, to possible pathophysiology, I want to briefly mention some neuroimaging studies. Uh, so people were trying to find out, well, can we see how different areas of the brain get activated differently than people have or have not hallucinations? So this is an interesting case report from a, a group at uh, Rush in Chicago. And they reported on a, a patient with Parkinson's disease who had very frequent stereotyped visual hallucinations of African tribesmen and chimpanzees. And I don't know about his background. <laughs> I'm not sure if he worked as a missionary or similar. Um, so what they did is uh, de design a ventilated fMRI study um, during which the patient was experiencing hallucinations. And they saw distinct areas of activation in frontal lobe areas and decreased activation in um, visual areas during the hallucinations. Uh, so this is kind of an uh, area here uh, where they saw the um, increased frontal uh, activations and the decreased visual activations in the occipital lobe. So imaging is, is uh, uh, difficult to do in these patients, and uh, this is kind of a review paper uh, published in uh, 2015 in Parkinsonism and Related Disorders, looking at all reported studies in the literature um, on hallucinations 
So there wasn't really a single finding, but uh, these areas high marked here. So again, in the um, visual cortex, in the uh, limbic structures here, frontal lobe structures. So there's different activations, um, kind of as expected. Um, decreased activation usually in uh, uh, um, visual symptoms and increased activation in uh, limbic structures. So there seems to be a, a disconnect uh, with the uh, uh, true uh, visual input and, uh, and the uh, emotional regulation while people are experiencing these. So coming back to more practical issues, what would we kind of do every day? Well, how do we manage these patients? Uh, so first of all, um, especially working here in the hospital, we all know, and I've mentioned that in, uh, previously, so delirium, uh, of course, needs to be thought of uh, primarily when people do experience uh, hallucinations, especially if it's uh, coupled with uh, confusion. So we want to make sure, um, again, especially if people present newly uh, with this problem, to rule out underlying infections, uh, UTIs, metabolic, endocrine abnormalities. So, right, so we usually check labs. Um, and uh, uh, check, review their medication history, especially asking for over-the-counter medications. So uh, some of the common offenders, I don't know how many residents are here, but uh, what I see all the time, you know, people take over-the-counter Benadryl at night, don't put it on their medication list. People might be scopolamine patches very, very commonly. People take uh, uh, or things for, for chronic nausea, for insomnia, but it not, uh, might not be reporting. So very important to really um, ask, ask them to bring in all their medications, really kind of review everything and make sure it's not a medication-induced problem. We also want to ask for psychosocial stressors, any changes in living circumstances, any stressful events. So one of the patients I quoted uh, in the beginning who was uh, seeing all these spiders, uh, she was um, in her 80s and had been charged of organizing the birthday party for her mother, who was about to turn 100. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that was a kind of a very stressful event for her and really uh, provoked uh, almost kind of a, a breakdown. And after this whole birthday was over, she was actually doing well and we didn't need to medicate her for her hallucinations. So it's just uh, really important to, to uh, keep that in mind, to ask patients about that. Um, and then if we don't really find an underlying metabolic abnormality, medication we can blame, we want to take a close look at their Parkinson's medication. And as I mentioned, uh, certainly all dopaminergic medications can cause or worsen hallucinations. Um, as can, as we have just learned, uh, Parkinson's even unmedicated, right? Because of uh, what we think mostly that Lewy body spread. Uh, so patients can experience hallucinations even without being on medications. So that being said, um, oftentimes patients with uh, advanced Parkinson's disease are on multiple different medications. So if we kind of think in, in the order of the most likely offenders, so the uh, sequence, what I like to do is I want to first eliminate or wean them off anticholinergics. I don't use anticholinergics much to begin with, but uh, if for whatever reason there are anticholinergics, and of course we very commonly have patients on uh, bladder medications with anticholinergic mechanisms. So this is really kind of a double-edged sword. Yes, we want to help their bladder, but no, we don't want to make them confused and uh, uh, hallucinating. So oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, it is uh, necessary to wean them off these uh, medications. Now, I'm uh, not, uh, might not be most up to date with the urology literature, but I think there are some medications which uh, uh, are better tolerated. I, I heard that the trospium is better tolerated. So at any rate, but a lot of times, any cholinergics really need to go. Um, otherwise, amantadine is also um, a medication, partly due to its anticholinergic properties, that, that can cause reverse hallucinations. Uh, and then MAL-B inhibitors, dopamine agonists, and levodopa. So levodopa um, is the most effective medications in treating Parkinson's and uh, the least likely to cause side effects. So that's kind of my cornerstone of the therapy. Everyone else is, is kind of optional around it. And uh, uh, again, if people are having side effects and prominent hallucinations, I really uh, uh, reduce uh, and wean them off. 
So especially dopamine agonists are uh, kind of falling more out of favor. So we used to be used to be kind of thinking probably 10 years ago, we really need to start people on dopamine agonists. People, um, levodopa should be reserved until people quote unquote really need it. Um, and one of the, the, the main uh, thought behind it was avoiding dyskinesias. Uh, because dyskinesias um, are somewhat more likely to appear if people are started early on levodopa and especially in high doses. Now, we have learned that dopamine agonists really come with their own set of problems, make people much more sedated, and especially a troublesome side effect can be impulse control disorders. Uh, and I don't know, who, who have, uh, hands up if you have seen a patient on impulse control disorders with um, dopamine agonists. So impulse control disorders meaning hypersexuality, gambling, uh, internet addiction, um, spending too much money. <laughs> so I, I only saw two or three hands. I don't, you've probably seen people, even if you don't realize, <laughs> because people are not uh, very forthcoming in telling you these things. But uh, it's, it's a very common issue and should also be kept in mind if you have people on a dopamine agonist for restless leg syndrome, for example, because it can really... Uh, uh, be very um, uh, dramatic for patients. And again, one of these things, people are not volunteering. So really important to ask and ask the spouse caregiver. I have, I have many, many patients, and it is for dopamine agonists, it's up to 15%. Uh, with levodopa itself, it's an up to 6 to 7%. So it should really be asked for. Um, so just some of my, sorry, I'm kind of uh, veering off here, but I kind of just thought it would be a really good teaching point for, for uh, especially... Um, uh, we all see people on on these medicines, and I've uh, I had this uh, guy who was really making minimal income, uh, but spending a hundred dollars per week on lottery tickets, which for him was uh, you know very um, um, too much. <laughs> um, and I have another patient uh, who bought a new truck every month or <laughs> tried to apply for a new truck. So his house is uh, ruined, his credit is ruined, and it's just a, a very um, can be pretty, really devastating uh, to people. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, so antipsychotic agents um, certainly um, are kind of uh, needed if uh, none of these other measures I talked about, medication adjustment, et cetera, is really sufficient in uh, helping patients. Now, as you know, um, antipsychotics now all come with a black box, black box warning for higher risk of mortality in the elderly with dementia uh, due to um, arrhythmias. Um, and uh, specifically to be kept in mind with Parkinson's, most antipsychotics really worsen Parkinson's and should not be used or only in small doses. So especially the common, uh, the typical neuroleptics such as um, haloperidol, risperdone, really can uh, worsen Parkinson's patients and should not be used. So what do we use? Uh, Quetiapine, so brand name Seroquel, has a greater affinity for serotonergic uh, to um, A receptors than B dopamine receptors. So quetiapine is kind of the go-to medication for um, hallucinations and psychosis and uh, uh, seems to be the most favorable profile in terms of the uh, motor effect on Parkinson's. Um, we don't have much literature, much clinical trials really to support its use. There have been several studies done, so specifically two double-blind trials, and they actually did not show significant improvement versus placebo. Now, one of the problems is that with most of these trials, the placebo effect is pretty high, so that probably makes it, makes it uh, difficult. But if you um, uh, survey movement disorder uh, specialists in their practice, I would say most people really use this and are convinced that it is working, and I mean, I'm pretty... Uh, my own practice, but that is uh, still my go-to medication. Um, what is uh, important is that contrary to schizophrenia, they use much lower doses. Uh, so again, there's not a guideline per se, but uh, uh, most people uh, in practice would maybe start with just 12.5 or 25 milligram 
Uh, and uh, since the hallucinations often occur in the evening or at bedtime, so we would give it like an hour before bedtime. I sometimes split it up, give one dose in the afternoon, one dose at bedtime, and then just sort of titrate it up to effect. So kind of increase it by 12.5 milligram every three days uh, to effect. And oftentimes people really get by the total dose of like 50, 75 milligram per day. Very rarely that I use more. Uh, most common side effect is sedation, of, and of course, if you use it at bedtime, it's, it's often a vaunted effect. Now, the best evidence out there is actually for clozapine or clozaril, uh, and this is really the only antipsychotic with unequivocal recommendation for the treatment um, of PD psychosis. It's not FDA approved for this indication. And of course, what really makes it uh, difficult to use is uh, the possible side effect of uh, agranulocytosis. So it does require uh, regular blood draws, and you also need to be specifically registered to prescribe it. Now, there is a new kit on the block. Uh, so there is this medication called pimavanserine or nuplazit. And this is uh, finally a FDA approved indication for Parkinson's hallucinations and psychosis. So this has been available since June 2016. Um, now, with a lot of these uh, new medications coming out these days, it is unfortunately only available through a specialty pharmacy. Uh, so it's a bit of a, a hassle to get it initially started. Um, however, um, it, uh, again, it is the only medication now which is FDA approved for uh, Parkinson um, hallucinations and psychosis. So what makes this medication different? Not a pharmacologist, but uh, this is an inverse agonist to this uh, serotonin 2A receptor. And what I'm told is that inverse agonism uh, really is a, a, almost a more complete uh, blockade of, uh, of this uh, medication. So it kind of empties... Uh, um, the kind of depletes uh, um, the serotonin and uh, can't, uh, can't bind. It does not interact with dopamine receptors. So this is a very uh, selective uh, mechanism on the serotonin re receptor. Uh, so the medication is really uh, thought to provide uh, improvement of the specific uh, hallucination symptoms without causing any uh, dopaminergic problems. So I'm kind of showing you some, uh, some of the uh, uh, details from the uh, study that led to its approval. So it was kind of an interesting uh, setup for this study because they had a, a two-week uh, placebo lead-in phase to kind of uh, get rid of this high placebo effect with many of these uh, trials. So they had uh, uh, 90 people in the placebo arm, 95 placebo on medication. And again, for two weeks, everyone got placebo, and then um, uh, for more weeks, people uh, got uh, either placebo or study drug. Uh, the uh, outcome was measured by the so-called uh, SAPS-PD, so looking for visual hallucinations, tactile, auditory, um, as well as the uh, delusions, which are common. And uh, usually a 2.3 change would... Uh, correlate to a one-point change in the clinical global uh, outcome scale. So how do the results look like? So this was kind of the um, two-week lead-in phase, and uh, so it's kind of interesting. So it really kind of uh, very parallel lines here between the placebo group and the treatment group, so reduction in um, hallucinations just with the uh, placebo phase. Um, however, um, over the rest of the study, there is a, a, a significant distinction between uh, the placebo group, which kind of uh, stays here, and the treatment group, which has further uh, reduction in symptoms. So, um, so again, this is a medication now which is available. Has anyone used it here in the audience? So it's probably still pretty much in hands of uh, uh, movement neurologists and psychiatrists uh, use it uh, now as well. Uh, so we'll kind of see where it ultimately finds its place. Uh, right now, again, it's the only FDA-approved medication, but unfortunately there's no head-to-head -head trials with quetiapine, for example. So we don't really know, uh, is it, you know, how much better it is or if it is better. A quick word on uh, cholesterol, uh, cholesterolase inhibitors. So there is some um, 
evidence, but rivastigmine might also be helpful for um, treatment of uh, PV psychosis. And a lot of patients are on this already, right, because we use it for treatment of dementia. So uh, we're not really, um, it's not quite as powerful, most likely, the effect, but uh, uh, there is probably a, a study uh, sponsored by the NIH coming out soon, which will uh, look a little bit in more detail. Uh, so it might uh, be a good option. Uh, people kind of might be benefit from this medication anyway. It, it could also have a positive effect on hallucinations. So kind of putting this all together, I just want to uh, finish with a uh, case report. So we have a 74-year-old woman with a six-year history, tremor-dominant Parkinson's, REM sleep behavior disorder, anxiety, and mild cognitive impairment. She reports seeing bugs in her peripheral vision fields and mice in the corner of her bedroom at night over the past month. Uh, she's also convinced that there are people down in the living room talking at night. Uh, she has hypertension, diabetes, and glaucoma, and she is on uh, carbidopa, levodopa, 25-200, two tablets four times a day, resagiline, lisinopril, insulin, and timolol eye drops. So what are we going to do with her? Anyone? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know the people, so I can't pick on people. <laughs> so as, a, as we kind of alluded to, we certainly want to do a medical workup for anyone presenting with new hallucinations. Uh, so certainly making sure she doesn't have hyponatremia, urinary tract infection, et cetera. We want to consider lowering her dopaminergic medication if possible. Of course, there's always the downside, but lowering medications will worsen her Parkinson's, potentially. Um, and so this particular patient was started on pimavanserine. Now, this medication is not titrated up. Uh, so uh, it comes in 17 milligram tablets, and the usual dose is two tablets per day. You just start it and need to tell the patient it takes two weeks to uh, have effect. Uh, but there's no titration for this. Uh, so she was started with this medication and did experience good benefit in symptom reduction after about a month. Um, this is, a, well, I, I kind of removed the uh, company, so I think it is uh, compliant with regulations, but I just kind of thought it was a bit of a, fry, a scary day. <laughs> so I don't have people uh, reporting chameleon <laughs> to me, so I think the company got rid of this. Uh, it looks a bit, looks a bit scary. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, I think it is important to really raise awareness of this problem, because I think it's really something that patients underreport and we don't really ask uh, enough, especially in non-demented patients, which are, as you now know, are experiencing hallucinations in a greater percentage than we realize. Uh, so um, as you uh, have all uh, heard last year, Robin Williams uh, died and was found at autopsy uh, to suffer from a very uh, kind of a seem seemingly an aggressive form of Lewy body dementia. Uh, which you now also know is kind of an overlap of uh, Parkinson's disease. And uh, his uh, um, widow, Susan Schneider Williams, has really done an amazing job of now raising awareness of this problem and has become a wonderful advocate for the uh, American uh, Academy of Neurology and their uh, funding uh, uh, brain pack uh, society. So uh, she has actually written an editorial for the uh, Journal of Neurology last fall, and I just want to kind of quote from this because I think it's just very uh, illustrative how people really suffer from this and how this really um, affects, um, you know, everyone uh, knowing the, the patient. Uh, Robin was growing very. The Parkinsonian mask was ever-present and his voice was weakened. His left-hand tremor was continuous now and he had a slow shuffling gait. He hated that he could not find the words he wanted in conversations. He would thrash at night and still have terrible insomnia. At times, he would find himself stru stuck in a frozen stance, unable to move, and frustrated when he came out of it. He was beginning to have trouble with visual and spatial abilities and the way of judging distance and depth. His loss of basic reasoning just added to his growing confusion. And later on, she says, while he never reported hallucinations, uh, she kind of very much suspected uh, that he was experiencing them. Uh, so a lot of these uh, uh, symptoms that we had talked about, and uh, kind of an interesting thing with Robin Williams, and I don't know him personally, <laughs> but uh, what, what she is kind of uh, laying open there, but uh, he then really undiagnosed for, for uh, uh, over a year uh, because people just felt he had a lot of stress and uh, depression. 
but uh, again, uh, his brain went to autopsy and showed uh, very aggressive uh, Lewy body dementia. So in summary, psychosis and visual hallucinations are very common in Parkinson's and often underreported. Uh, PD psychosis is a predictor of nursing home admission, increased mortality and caregiver stress, and management uh, of PD psychosis includes medical workup. Uh, we want to rule out co uh, contributing factors, reducing dopaminergic stimulation, and treating with atypical neuroleptic agents if needed. Uh, want to make a couple of announcements, just kind of take the opportunity of being here. If you have or know of patients with early Parkinson's disease, send them our way. We're currently recruiting for a, a study called Sure PD3, looking at the possible neuroprotective uh, benefit of inosine. Uh, so to be involved in this study, uh, you need to have a diagnosis of Parkinson's of less than three years and not be on medications other than now be uh, inhibitors. So usually when people come to us, they're <laughs> already on med or oftentimes on medication. So I'm just uh, throwing this out here. So if you know of patients with very early Parkinson's disease, let them know that we have a neuroprotective study and send them our way. Uh, we also have a lot to offer for Parkinson's uh, patient education. Uh, we got a, a very generous donation from the Bill Collins family with, uh, who um, had a Ford dealership here in town. And uh, we have just very recently opened a new Parkinson's education center in the lobby of Fraser, which is open from 10 to 3 every day. So if you'll come, uh, feel free to come by, visit us. Uh, we have a very um, extensive library on Parkinson's literature, other movement disorders as well. Uh, people can lend the books for up to three months at a time. We have monthly talks, uh, free exercise classes, um, availability to online research, et cetera. And we have our annual Parkinson's Symposium coming up on April 6th uh, with our keynote speaker, Dr. Oaken, coming from uh, University of Florida. And he is the uh, director of the Parkinson Foundation and uh, world-renowned uh, capacity in, in Parkinson's disease. So we're very excited about uh, him visiting. If you want to stay up to date with everything going on in our Movement Disorder Center, we have a quarterly newsletter and you can sign up for that. And uh, again, mostly uh, patient education events, but uh, I know Parkinson patients are uh, in your clinics as well. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well, it's interesting because actually smoking is uh, um, uh, uh, associated with a lower risk of getting Parkinson's. So it's one of the, I know smoking is bad for just about everything, <laughs> but uh, people uh, who smoke have about a, a twofold decreased risk of getting Parkinson's disease. So as far as the hallucinations go, so obviously people who abuse alcohol, you know, uh, experience uh, hallucinations. Uh, so, but this is, I mean, uh, Usually, um, we don't see much alcohol abuse in, in our Parkinson's patients, uh, so. Well, I was a little, so yeah. your answer sort of answered my question, but I was a little confused because in some cases you decrease the dopaminergic agent, but you also give it for an estrogen inhibitor, which can induce acetylcholine, which in the interceptor induces dopamine, <laughs> and, I, and I was confused by that. Yeah, it's a good point. So. It is kind of felt that with, uh, with dementia and MCI, you know, it, it, you know, there needs to be more estrogen, but uh, uh, it's a good point. So I guess it just kind of points to we don't really understand all the complex interaction, and it's more a balance and not kind of a simplistic, you know, too little, too much. Right. Right. So, uh, 
or dizziness. Um, they don't really report much side effects with it. Um, unfortunately, it is quite expensive. So it comes with a specialty pharmacy. It's about $1,000 a month. So it's certainly much uh, more expensive than uh, <coughs> pharmacy. So again, there's not, and, and unfortunately, it also carries the black box warning. Of course, it's hard to know. You know, people are, you know, especially if you see people at the end of life, they'll, you know, did you kind of precipitate <laughs> some, some parting event with the medication? It's hard to know, and if you don't have a, a you know, really controlled study, and it's hard to do. You know, I personally feel if people really, if you have ruled all other factors, if the hallucinations are a prominent factor, I mean, you need to help people. <laughs> Uh, so I certainly disclose this, but, you know, I mean, if, if people are having significant hallucinations, their caregivers going down, you know, I, I certainly think it's very reasonable to uh, use these medicines, and as long as you add it documented, you know, document black box warning with respect to patient and family. Uh, but um, I generally, if there's not a party history, uh, if they're not on other medications for long and period of time, I generally don't get a routine EKG. And um, so, so far, I mean, I have people who did really well with the simulantivine. We probably have started around 10 patients on it since it's been out soon. Uh, but it's, it's hard for me to really say, is it better or not than clopidogene? Uh, and I don't really have enough experience really to say. I think they'll, uh, so I often, especially if cost is a concern, and again, we're not, not going to know what's going to happen over the next month, uh, uh, I think it's very reasonable to start with clopidogene. and one interest would 